GDP is climbing and Annalee is slashing. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It's Friday. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This here is David Hansen. David, a couple things to hit on before we get to the headlines. First of all, we've got a sound machine here now. We do. It's, it's, a, it's a little one. It's just a little baby one. I, I think our producers are afraid of what would happen if they give me a full soundboard. I'm afraid you of what are, you are. I know. You, as soon as I brought that in here, you pulled that over to your side, basically trying to prevent me from doing something like that. That, that will not <laughs> fly here. This is a or will sophisticated it? show. <laughs> it's dangerous. The other thing, on a more serious note, the other thing, right before I came up here, uh, I saw this tweet from Bank of America Merrill Lynch, and it's some uh, some best ideas kind of thing for 2014 or themes for 2014. This one stuck out to me because we've talked about this a few times. It's number three. It says, pick stocks, not markets. And it says, falling correlations among individual equities suggest divergent returns and an environment that favors stock selection over indexing. So this goes back to that question we've hit on a few times of when is it a stock picker's market? And I completely disagree with what Merrill Lynch is saying here. If you're an indexer, if you're a, a, a retail investor that's indexing, continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to that and say, oh, all of a sudden now I have to stop indexing and pick stocks because somebody said it's a stock picker's market. Agreed, if you don't have the time to do it, Stick with the indexing, it's a good route to go. That's a good idea. Okay, let's get to the headlines. First headline of the day. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal. GDP grows 4.1% in the third quarter, biggest gain since 2011. This is the third revision of third quarter GDP, and I hope that we get a fourth revision because every revision has gone up. The advanced reading was 2.8%, the second reading was 3.6%, this third reading 4.1%. The economy in the third quarter just keeps improving despite the fact that the third quarter has been over for almost an entire quarter now. How many revisions are there? Is there a set is it the same no. number every time or is it yeah, just it's kind of a rolling no, 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 basis? Same number every time. Okay. They do it they do it the same way every time. And it's just it's a good reminder that when that first GDP reading comes out, actually frankly when any of the GDP mm -hmm. readings come out, Maybe, maybe don't bet your, bet your life savings, bet your retirement one way or the other on it. One of the things that uh, jumped out at me the most about this revision, in the previous revision of the GDP numbers, uh, PCE, personal consumption expenditures, that's basically consumer spending, had grown 1.4%, which showed a deceleration in the growth rate of consumer spending. Now they revised it up to 2%. That's a big deal. That now shows an increasing rate of growth for consumer spending. That's really what we want to see because consumer spending is such a big part of the U.S. economy. Yeah, and we've talked about on the show before how GDP isn't a good indicator of where the broader market is going. But when we're looking at banks, there's no question that an improving economy is good for the fundamentals of the bank. It doesn't mean that bank stocks are going to fly higher because of this, but the fundamentals will improve as the economy does. Taper? Does this... <laughs> Make Just it, back up the Fed's taper. I guess so. Their gradual decrease of ten billion. Yeah, it's ten it's billion is not nothing. Yeah. Second headline. Second headline. Going to some worse news, you could say. Annually Capital Management announces fourth quarter 2013 dividend of thirty cents per share. That is down from thirty five cents per share. That was my first time using the soundboard. It felt good. Uh, <laughs> it does feel good. Doesn't feel as good as the dividend cut, five cent dividend cut. Uh, Maybe a little Wait, bit. Wait, you're saying the dividend cut does feel good? No, I said it does not feel good. That felt better than the dividend cut. Okay. Um, maybe not as bad as some were expecting. For me, I'm not necessarily invested in Annalee for next quarter's dividend. I think this needs to be a holding that you're willing to hold for a very long time. It's not a great time for the business right now. For the industry as a whole, these pure play agency mortgage REITs here, I don't think you should be worried about these quarterly moves with the dividend. It's all about playing the long term here, positioning the company to benefit in five years from now, not necessarily maintaining a quarterly dividend. Just to put some numbers to this, the new dividend is 30 cents. That's down from 35 cents. For September 2012, the dividend was, so a year ago, well, a little bit more than a year ago, was 50 cents. Mm -hmm. So down considerably from there. In the company's earnings release, it says of the dividend, the company distributes dividends based on its current estimate of taxable earnings per common share. So this is kind of a, a look ahead to, to what's going on. 
in the September quarter, core earnings were down 8% year over year, which isn't, which isn't that big considering the big chop to the dividend. Mm -hmm. So I think this continues to suggest that the management team is being very conservative in, in what, they're, what they're seeing, what they're expecting for the, the months to come. And, uh, and unlike a, a big kind of bellwether dividend paying stock like a Procter & Gamble, this dividend could be ramped up quickly if the scenario right. yeah, yeah. played out in their favor. If the yield curve was a little bit steeper, they ramped up leverage, which is very low right now. You could see this dividend jump up pretty quickly. Uh, if that worked out for them. Yeah, that's actually, that's a really good point. And that's something that investors in Annaly, particularly new, people newer to Annaly, newer investors to Annaly, uh, need to understand. Because when people usually think about dividends, like a proc keep, stay on Procter & Gamble, if Procter & Gamble were to significantly cut its dividend, that would be, it would be suggesting something mm -hmm. relatively catastrophic for that company. Because they, the strategy is not to pay out uh, an overwhelming dividend that it can't keep up and grow every right. year. That's Procter & Gamble's strategy. So if there's a dividend cut there, you know there's big trouble. Granted, there is some trouble annually in terms of facing a tough environment, but because it's a REIT, it has to pay out most of its money in dividends. Um, so a, a, a cut just basically means it's facing a tough environment. Uh, it doesn't mean that the company is swirling down the down the drain or right. anything like that uh, and like you said the dividend could come back quickly and significantly if conditions are absolutely third headline of the day here's a fun one here financial astrology can the stars affect stocks this is from the telegraph the article is essentially about a uh, a, a trader who came up using technical analysis and then got into using astrology, using the positions of the stars and the planets to create mathematical formulas to predict what the market is, uh, is going to do. And this particular astrological trader has actually had a top-ranked newsletter, it has a newsletter based on these mm -hmm. that, that has subscribers, many trader subscribers, wouldn't name the traders in this, in this article, but said, Big time traders subscribe to this newsletter, and it's been a top ranked newsletter before. David, are you buying into it's astrology? Pretty, it was a pretty tough article to get through without just shaking your head a little bit. And they point to the 2008 crash, and this guy says that he predicted it by spotting some pretty ugly aspects, squares, oppositions, and 45 degree angles. <laughs> I, was, I read that, and I didn't even know what that meant. Squares. Um, you can find patterns when you look for them. Um, I think this is an example of one of them. Over a longer period of time, I, I have a hard time believing that this is really giving someone an advantage. I think you'd be better spent reading 10Ks and, and transcripts of conference calls than trying to read the stars. The, the Super Investors of Graham and Doddsville, a uh, classic Buffett writing, uh, talks about a, a coin flipping contest and basically uses that story as a basis to point out that a bunch of uh, investors, major investors, schooled in the same value investing type of school, have performed very well over time. In this case, this is the first time I've ever heard of a financial astrologer uh, performing well over time. So, if this is a if this person is getting um, a, a top ranked newsletter, I'm wondering whether that's not just. An coin, anomaly. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the coin flipping going in his favor. One of the things I thought was interesting. This was an, uh, a quote from an academic in the article saying, "Superstitions in general increase when people are under stress, and financial markets can be a little stressful sometimes." Yes, sir. All right, moving on to our focus for the day, and that is why I've got this nice stack of books here. We're gonna we're gonna go back and talk about some of our favorite books mm -hmm. from 2013 or some of the, our favorite books that we read in yes. 2013. And I'll start off, this is one of my favorites right here. I've actually, keeping this copy on my desk, this is The Outsiders by William Thorndike. Profiles eight CEOs, some of whom people have probably never heard of. Mm -hmm. And the immense returns that they created for their shareholders, sometimes or, or oftentimes through through, through ways that we wouldn't expect as shareholders to see it. Um, a lot of it was through capital allocation. That was a big theme in this book, capital allocation. The CEOs 
figuring out where is the best place to put company capital, even if in a lot of cases that was simply spending a lot of money to buy shares back yes. of the company at advantageous, at advantageous times. One CEO, of course, that people probably will recognize from this book, Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And I'll go ahead and, 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 and give my second one here just because I'm talking about Buffett. I've got the, I picked up the three volume, uh, three volume set of, of permanent value, the story of Warren Buffett. Admittedly, I have not read the entire thing. Looks but heavy. It, it, it's actually really heavy. I got to work out carrying this up to the studio. Uh, one of the things that I love about of permanent value is that the table of contents lends itself well to just jumping into various um, various parts of Buffett's career. Mm -hmm. You don't have to read it from cover to cover. Um, you can uh, you can jump to areas like annual report whoppers. Warren and Ajit haul in eleven billion, or uh, let's see, what's another one? Ovarian lottery winners. There you go. <laughs> or um, who was going to go in a foxhole with me? Uh, what I will say is that one of, one of my favorite sections that I've read so far of, uh, of permanent value is a section about Wells Fargo, um, specifically Buffett's initial investment for Berkshire Hathaway and Wells Fargo back in the 90s. Let me just read a quick paragraph here from it. Buffett's original investment came once again when there was a stigma surrounding the purchase. Again, this is Wells Fargo. Because 1990 was a terrible time for banks, the very idea of buying a bank stock seemed outrageous at the time. What the word bank meant in the day was layoffs, real estate loan write-offs, slash dividends, and some smear by association with the SNL crisis. Some pundits were suggesting that rapidly declining real estate prices could bring down the banking system. Sounds pull, familiar. Pull SNL <laughs> crisis out of there, and that could have perfectly described 2008 and 2009. And what was Buffett doing in 2008 and 2009? Buying banks. Again. <laughs> so there's that. How about you? What was on your reading list this year? The Outsiders was as well. And the one thing I'll say about that great book, and it really opens your eyes to the value that buybacks can create. Buybacks. There you go. <laughs> and in the book, it makes you, after you read it, it's, a, it's an outstanding book, but be cautious that it puts buybacks in such a good light. These are the exceptions. These eight CEOs, mm -hmm. they're the exceptions of thousands of CEOs that don't buy back their stock at the right time. So don't read this book and say, okay, everybody who's buying back their stock knows exactly what they're doing. They're geniuses and right. I'm gonna crush the market. These guys are the exceptions. So just be careful. Uh, it almost seems like a, a contrarian kind of mindset of these CEOs. They were buying back at stock when no one thought they should be buying back stock. So just a, a word of note there. Um, the other couple that I read, not necessarily investing books, don't have any Wells Fargo anecdotes, uh, read <laughs> The Power of Habit, just an interesting book yeah. kind of about your own mindset, why you do certain things. We can get into some bad habits as investors. So that would be one that I would recommend. And also the one I'm currently reading, haven't finished it. I know this is one that you've read is The Success Equation. Uh, by Michael Mobison. Am I saying mm -hmm. that right? I can never get his name right. Very good book. Believe Warren Buffett has read the book. I think that was one of the uh, ones that he's read. So reading the same thing at Warren Buffett, never a bad thing to do. It doesn't hurt. Very interesting book in terms of understanding that when it comes to investing, there's a lot of luck involved. We don't like to admit that. We all like to think that we're geniuses and that everything happens just how we planned it because we saw the future and we saw that stock was going to double. It makes us recognize that there's a lot of luck involved and in how to maybe move, the, move it down the spectrum so we do have more skill in the equation, but we can't get luck out of the equation. That's fair. I, it, was, it was actually kind of difficult for me to pick out my favorite books of 2013. It's been a great reading year for me. Uh, great by Choice was one that I picked up this year. That's Jim Collins. That was a follow-up to Good to Great, but mm -hmm. actually he sort of thinks of it as almost a prequel to Good to Great, the way it ended up coming out. Fatal Risk, a book about uh, AIG. I really enjoyed that, the background that it gave on the crisis um, and, and what AIG did to get it to the position it was in to, to nearly fail. Uh, brick by Brick, uh, a, a story about Lego and, and specifically how Lego nearly bankrupted itself uh, after, after decades of success and then came back and is now once again one of the greatest toy companies in the world. Uh, and, then, and then sort of more on the f uh, more fun side, what I talk about when I talk about running by uh, Haruki Murakami, uh, it's a 
sort of a book about running, but more just a meditation of a, a really good author. I've, I've read a couple of his other books. Really good author as he runs. Uh, Psychopath Test by John Ronson. A little bit obsessed with psychopaths. I find them kind of interesting. This is a really, really good read because Ronson's a great writer. And then The Power of One by Bryce Courtney. Uh, my wife and I went to South Africa earlier this year, and this is a book set in South Africa. Uh, just a really good novel, fun read. A novel? Well, Interesting. Yeah, every once in a while you. I do pick up a novel. So cultured. I know, right? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Let's see, is there a sound for that? Oh, that, yeah, didn't, that didn't work. Not the best sound, maybe. <laughs> wah, wah. We do have a sound for that. Mailbag. Right, let's head on to the mailbag. We have an email address. That email address is WTMI at fool.com. We love getting questions, comments. And what I will say in terms of comments, we uh, once again the other day I put out a challenge for our female listeners to email us and let us yep. know that we have female listeners because once again, David, you played the doubter and you were wrong. <laughs> we continue to get emails from female listeners proving that we have a very diverse audience. Anyway, question for today. How does a stock price directly affect a company? What would make a company want their stock to go up and how would it benefit by increasing returns to stockholders, uh, increasing dividends? After the company has an IPO and they get a certain amount of money for putting their shares in the market, wouldn't the stock price have no effect on them? David, thoughts? To some extent, it doesn't have an effect on them once they get their, their money that it trades as it will, but uh, it impacts them to the extent that they can buy back shares uh, with excess capital or use their shares as currency to go out and make acquisitions. That's something in the book, The Outsiders, they say when the stock was cheap, management bought shares back. When the stock was expensive, they used it as currency to go issue more shares and buy it. So when your stock's overvalued, you want to take advantage of the price that the market's giving you just like uh, anybody else would and go out and buy companies with it. So that's when uh, they would be interested in what the market's giving their price. Now I'll take the flip side of that from the perspective that, and you, you did mention buying back shares, but in terms of why a company would be concerned about its stock price, if the stock price falls far enough, that can be a great opportunity for the company to buy back shares. When the company initially sells on the IPO, uh, they're selling shares that theoretically are fairly valued mm -hmm. based on what they think it's worth, what the, the initial buyers think it's worth. And so if the price in the future falls below what the company thinks it's worth, and, and you'd hope that the companies you own do this sort of calculation before they buy back shares, mm -hmm. it can be very advantageous, advantageous for shareholders for the company to buy back stock. Yep. An example of um, an acquisition that was all stock is we think back to the Bank of America Merrill Lynch acquisition. We hear that $50 billion number thrown around. Bank of America paid $50 billion for Merrill Lynch. It's crazy. That was an all stock deal. So it was dependent on the stock price of Bank of America when the deal went through. So that deal actually ultimately cost around $21 billion because it was an all stock deal. Bank of America stock had decreased in value from the time that the acquisition was announced to when it was closed. So that's an example of how these prices can fluctuate a lot. There you go. Let's head on to the game for today. We're kind of doing a combo investing chicken and email question. Uh, this, this question came from uh, Muffy Stanford. The question is, you own Visa, MasterCard, and American Express announces a plan to spin off its lending business. Who knows, maybe to become an online bank. The Amex network gets a higher interchange fee than the other two. And if the network is no longer affiliated with a competitive credit card business, is there a danger that a chunk of the big bank credit card transaction business could migrate to Amex? The Amex network could offer banks a higher percentage of each transaction than its bigger rivals, giving it an advantage in a pricing war for bank business. Would this potential threat to market share make you sell Visa or MasterCard stock? I don't think it would make me sell, but I mean, it's another competitor in the space. Right now, I think Amex controls around 10 to 15% of the US payment volume. So they're a pretty small player compared to MasterCard and Visa who are the, the beasts out there. I was trying to think, it's, a, it's an interesting question because first of all, I don't think American Express would spin off that and, and become a, the same competitor, the same type mm -hmm. of company as MasterCard and Visa because they like to own the whole relationship rather than having the acquiring bank, the issuing bank. They like to have the whole relationship so they can charge higher fees because they're offering more security, uh, right. more promotion to the, to the merchants there. So 
I don't see a scenario they would do that, but even if they did do that, I wouldn't be too concerned from MasterCard and Visa's perspective because they have such a big lead in the market share already. Well, we don't actually have to wait for American Express to potentially spin off that part of its business because it has started, start, it has started to create relationships with banks mm -hmm. to, go, to go outside and, and uh, have those kind of outside bank relationships. Still not a very big part of, of Amex, but not, not what uh, Muffy is talking about here. I, you know, I'm with you. It wouldn't make me sell Visa and MasterCard, but it would make me potentially interested mm -hmm. in picking up that part of Amex's business because what we're talking about here is not necessarily just one company that's blowing everybody else out of the water. I do think Visa is the, the leader, at least in terms of the, the overall market, and I've said that I've liked Visa for that um, from that perspective before. Uh, but globally, we're seeing an expanded usage of, of, of cards and less uses of uh, cash transactions. So I would just be excited to have MasterCard as more of a pure play mm -hmm. in just the card and transaction um, network uh, model. Right. It wouldn't, I don't think it would be good for Visa and MasterCard because it would be more competition. They'd have to potentially increase the incentives they give to merchants to accept their cards. So maybe it would hurt profitability, profitability a little bit. But... I don't think it would be a long term. Maybe, maybe, pressure. but if if Amex got that aggressive, then it risks hurting its its brand. It's got a differentiated brand right now, mm -hmm. and if it if it just got crazy and just said, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna cut cut prices, try to do all this to increase relationships and just blow volume uh, out of the roof," then it risks uh, uh, killing that high end image that mm -hmm. that Amex has. I mean, I think about a, a, a store like. Um, like Nordstrom, if Nordstrom suddenly opened up 300 stores, I think it's it may have less than 200 stores currently. If all of a sudden they, they went on this wild spree and opened 300 stores all over the place, and they're like, we're gonna take we're gonna beat Macy's into the ground, mm -hmm. then they risk not being Nordstrom anymore, not having that high end edge. And I would worry about the same risk for Mastercard or American Express if it did the same thing. Yep. So I think one of the big advantages to that would be having the pure play business but also still having that high-end uh, brand image. All right. So that's my take. Tweets. On to the Twitter sphere. David, what's our first tweet? First tweet is from Reuters Live, at Reuters Live. Happening now, U.S. Senate holds test vote on the nomination of Janet Yellen to head the Federal Reserve. What is a test vote? I do not know. Bringing in our senior political correspondent, Matt Kopenheffer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well. Testing the vote. I, I'm, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a politics. I try to avoid politics as much as I can. But I mean, the thing is, is that the, they don't want to bring a vote to the floor. I mean, that's kind of the thing with politics, right? Is that they don't want to look bad. That's a big part of the. That's a big part of the show here. So they're going to test the the waters to make sure that when they bring Janet Yellen mm -hmm. to an actual vote, that they know it's going to happen. Which is kind of a maybe a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. But I mean. Strategically, I guess it's smart. She's going to get confirmed. I, I I'm think so. I'm willing to make that prediction. When she comes in, is she going to halt the taper immediately? Oh, yeah, probably. She's probably going to grow to be seven feet tall, <laughs> grow a beard like Ben Renee. It's just going to be crazy. It's second gonna, second tweet. Totally crazy. Second tweet. Crazy. It's from J.C. J. Comer. Uh, the Twitter address is at... A-L-E-A -E underscore. Interesting. Uh, the tweet is, gold heads for biggest annual loss in 32 years. Gold has been on a, on a bull run for, I think it's, it was going on 13 years. And now, biggest loss in 32 years. Were you ever on board with the gold run? Nope. Don't own any. Don't have a desire to own any. Will, if it continues to fall, is there a point at which you're buying gold? Probably not. Nope. I would rather own businesses for the long haul. I got a lot of time in front of me. I, I am more comfortable owning a business that makes a lot of money and compounds returns than owning gold. Well, Are you? They, Do you own uh, it? No. Okay. Sorry, gold. At, at, so, at some point. Gold people. Yeah. <laughs> gold people. Sorry, gold people. Made, made <laughs> out of gold. I don't want any of you. At some point, I could see it being being interesting, but. Not right now. I kind of want like a gold coin, like a pirate. That'd be cool to have. I've always wanted to like buy something and throw a bag of gold coins. Or in. like, or like a an Uncle Scrooge kind of thing, yeah. where you have a big thing of gold coins that you could swim I through. I thought it was a Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, he said what Uncle did I Scrooge. <laughs> What's the difference between Uncle Scrooge and Scrooge McDuck? Uncle Scrooge is just a mean uncle that doesn't like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, finishing off with the last tweet of the day, we talked about Uncle Scrooge is oh, okay. Go ahead. No, no, no. Our <laughs> we talked about our favorite holiday movies 
the other day, and Chris Berenson says, favorite holiday movie, Die Hard. Love the podcast, guys. I forgot Die Hard was technically a Christmas movie. That's they're right. at, they're right. at the, the Nakatomi <laughs> Christmas party, and That's amazing. everything goes, goes to hell. Good call. <laughs> Very good call. Die Sneaky. Hard. Sneaky Christmas movie. Man, that's a long applause. <laughs> Standing because that out. was a really good that was yeah. a really good answer. That's okay, so so here's here's the Twitter here's the Twitter challenge this time. Sneaky Christmas movies. Tweet us at TMF Financials with your one. sneaky Christmas movies. Yeah. I can't even think of one. That was a good one. That was a really good one. All right, I think that's all we got, right? Yep. All right. We have an email address, WTMI at fool.com. You can email us questions and comments. Find us on Facebook. We're Motley Fool Financial Sector on Facebook. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This here is David Hansen. We will see you next week. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.